All right, we're going to jump in this morning. Um, another awesome story we're going to take a look at this morning. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the Written in Red series that is really impacting your life. I was telling somebody the other day, I obviously love teaching and, and getting into the Word, no matter where it is, but um, there's something about sharing the words of Jesus that's just extra powerful that I just love uh, even more. So I've been, I've been really enjoying this. I mean, going through the Scriptures and looking at what Jesus said and and knowing that he said it, like it, I hope we never take that for granted. And we see those letters written in red. These are the, the words of our Lord and Savior. That's awesome. So we're going to take a look at uh, Mark chapter 2 this morning, verses 13 through 17. Um, we are going to look at a lot of scripture this morning, even though we're going to be anchored just in these five verses this morning. We're going to look at a story that's also um, told in Matthew chapter 9 and Luke chapter 5 as well. So you may want to just jot a note down uh, to read those as well, because again, like we talked about last week, whenever you have multiple accounts in the scriptures, uh, we get different points of view and different perspectives, so it helps to fill out the story. So I would encourage you to read those as well. We're going to be in Mark chapter 2, starting with verse 13. It says, once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. And sort of as a background here, we, we read the story last week about Jesus healing the paralyzed man who had uh, a group of his friends bring him before Jesus to get healed. Um, and we, we learned in that story that Jesus is in Capernaum. This is sort of his home base where he set up ministry at. This is a, where Simon Peter lived and many of the other uh, disciples. So this is where Jesus is when it talks about beside the lake. Uh, it's the Lake of Gennesaret. It's also the Sea of Galilee. It's referred to a couple of different names. So this is where Jesus is. Uh, this will be important. Uh, for us in a second. And, and today's story really is, is a lot like last week. There's going to be two parts to it. So you're kind of going to get a two-for-one special this morning. We're going to take a look at both parts of the story, and each one, I think, gives us a, a little bit of a different perspective, a different takeaway for us this morning, but we're going we're to put them together in a, sort of one whole story this morning. So once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. Okay, it's the end of the sort of the first half of this story, and it's only two verses, but it's jam-packed with all kinds of awesome information and, and things to impact us. Okay, so um, just real quickly to just talk about what's going on here. Jesus is, is down by the seashore again, as he frequently was, and he's teaching the Word of God, which he frequently was. All right, and he began to, get, to develop a crowd, as he frequently did. Okay, people were, were flocking to Jesus everywhere that he went. So this is no, no different. He's there, he's preaching, he's teaching. People hear that he's, that he's doing this, and they begin to flock to him. So he's kind of walking along the seashore, and he's talking to this crowd of people and teaching them about the Word of God. When all of a sudden he comes across this man who is sitting at, a, at his booth, he is a tax collector, and Jesus says, follow me. And what does the man do? He follows Jesus. Okay, now this isn't completely shocking to us. We've seen this before. Okay, this is not an unfamiliar event. We, we've read earlier how Jesus has called several of the disciples by saying, hey, come follow me. Right, we read about Peter and Andrew and James and John, the fishermen who Jesus says, come follow me, and they drop their nets, leave everything behind, and follow Jesus. Okay, so this is not an unfamiliar story. But there's something very different about this story. Something very impactful. Remember, people, the, the writers of the scriptures didn't put stuff in there just for fun. Okay, they were intentional. They were Holy Spirit led in what they put in the scriptures. So what is it about this event that's different? What is it about this event that's special? What is it that we're supposed to take away from this event? I think we find the answer in the main characters in this story. So we have Jesus and then we have this man, Levi. Okay, he's a tax collector, which means we find out a lot of information about him right away. Okay, let's talk about tax collecting during this time. Um, Israel was occupied by Rome during this time. In about 63 B.C., Rome invades Israel, invades Jerusalem, takes over the nation, and it becomes the controlling nation during this time. Okay, so they are, over, they are overseeing Israel. They're in control of Israel during this time. And this has been going on for about 100 years to this point. Okay. So Rome comes in, they take over, and like any government, they want their money, so they decide they're going to tax the people. So they tax the, the people of Israel very heavily, 
Okay, but what they found was they were having problems collecting the taxes. This became an issue. They were unfamiliar with the industries there. They were into, uh, unfamiliar with the culture there. So they found it very difficult to, to collect these taxes. So they came up with a more efficient way, and that was to hire Jewish men to collect the taxes. Okay, so what they would do is they would take a certain area, and they would take bids on this, on this area. So Jewish men would come and say, I'll be willing to, to collect the taxes for this much above and beyond, okay? So Rome would say, hey, we want 40% as our tax rate, and whatever you get above and beyond that is yours. So the men would come in and say, I'll do it for 45% or whatever. And then one of these men was selected, and this was their tax area, so they would collect taxes. All right, a couple ways that they did this were they, they would set up these booths along the highways, along the roadways, going in and out of the cities from one area to another. So they would collect these tolls, or they would go down by the seashore where there was industry, like the fishing industry, and they would collect taxes from, from the fishermen. Okay? These men were obviously hated by the Jews for several reasons. One, they're tax collectors. So much like today, if you get a phone call from the, the IRS, you're not looking forward to that, right? It's not a conversation you, you're, you're wanting and saying, I hope the tax man calls me today. They were, so much like today, these people were, were despised. They were hated for a couple of different reasons. The first one being that they could charge basically whatever they wanted above and beyond what Rome demanded. So if, Rome, if the Roman government said we want 40%, these men could say, okay, we're going to collect 45, but then collect 48, collect 50 Okay, some people, uh, some experts have, have believed that, they were, that the Israelites were taxed all the way up to 50% of whatever they made. Okay, so these men were extortionists, they were criminals, they were cheating their own people, so they were absolutely despised. Okay, now on top of that, that's not the only reason why they were despised, there was a bigger reason. It wasn't just that they were criminals, it's not just that they were cheaters, there was something else. These men were collecting funds for an occupying government, okay? They were collecting money to support a government that had killed and oppressed their people for a hundred years. Imagine this. Can you imagine someone who would be collecting money to support ISIS from this country? To collect money to support ISIS and terrorizing the United States. Okay, that's what these men were doing. They were viewed as traitors, okay? They were, they were viewed as, as a... a accessories basically to murder and oppression that's why these men were despised okay we find out that Levi also known as Matthew in Matthew chapter 9 is one of these men he is extorting his own people he is supporting a, a foreign government that is oppressing and killing them okay now we find out some other things and this, this is a little more speculative but we're given some evidence in here that maybe Matthew is hated even more than most. Okay, we, we read in Mark chapter 2 and also in, in Luke chapter 5 that his name is Levi. In Matthew 9, it's Matthew. Many experts believe that maybe he had two names, that he was Matthew Levi. And that's why we have him called two different ways. Experts maybe believe that this name Levi has historical significance, cultural significance to it. Um, many of you may remember that Levi is the son of Jacob and the ancestor of the Levites, the people that God chose to be the priests, okay? So it's possible that Matthew is from that line, that he is a Levite. He is Matthew Levi, Matthew the Levite, all right? So he would have been viewed as someone who came from a line where he should have been serving God in the temple. Instead, he's serving and occupying government, okay? So it's quite possible that this man was hated even more than most, all right? He would not have been someone that people would have associated with. We're going to read about that in, in a minute. Okay? He would have been someone who, again, was despised, that was hated, and yet Jesus comes across him and invites him to follow him, to be a disciple, to be one of his men, one of his guys, to have relationship with him. Okay? This is unbelievable. First of all, this was not how it was done. A rabbi did not pick uh, his students. The students came to the rabbi and asked to follow him. Jesus is, is going against that. He is choosing disciples. He's saying, I pick you, and he picks this guy. All right? In the eyes of the religious leaders of the time, it was bad enough that Jesus is picking no-name fishermen. Nobodies. 
He's handpicking them. And now you're picking this guy, a sinner, a tax collector, and yet that's what Jesus does. He says, you, follow me. I, we're not given a whole lot of details about this. We don't really know what's going through Matthew's mind, but I, I can kind of imagine. This is a guy, I don't care how hard and how callous you are, to know that you are hated can't feel good. To every day have men despising you, looking down on you, dreading the sight of you. I can only imagine him sitting at his booth, and he's heard Jesus, right? Jesus has been teaching in this area. He maybe has heard Jesus preaching. Maybe he was in attendance when Jesus healed the paralyzed man. He's heard the stories of Jesus cleansing the leper. Or he, maybe he's sitting there and he's thinking, if only it was me. If only Jesus would touch me. And here he comes, coming towards him. I can only see Matthew with his head hanging down, maybe trying to avoid eye contact with this, this rabbi, this healer. And I can just hear Jesus calling his name, Matthew, follow me. Does he hesitate? Does he say, well, hold on, wait, let me collect my things? What's he do? He follows Jesus immediately. Why? He knows. Right? He knows his condition. We're going to talk about this in a minute. He knows he's a sinner. He knows how he's viewed. And this man, this rabbi, chooses him to follow him. So immediately he follows him. I think in this, these two verses, this short story, we see Jesus' grace on display. Don't we? This man has done absolutely nothing to deserve Jesus saying, follow me. Nothing. He's not even one of the ones that comes to Jesus. Right? This man shows no initiative. Shows no, he's, he's sitting there. And Jesus, out of his love, out of his compassion, out of his grace, he goes to him and touches him and says, follow me. Unbelievable grace. All right, so let's continue on with the second part of the story. Verse 15. It says, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, and, and Luke, is, in his account, is going to tell us that Levi throws a party. He throws this banquet in Jesus' honor. It says, well, Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house. Many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. And I love that there's a designation here. It's not just sinners. There's sinners and tax collectors. <laughs> Have you noticed that? This is a special class of sinner. Okay, this isn't just a sinner. This is, he's eating with sinners and tax collectors. <laughs> I, lo I love that. All right, it says, when the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Okay, now how does this come about? How in the world do the Pharisees even get into this conversation? During this time, um, it, it was not uncommon for someone to throw a banquet, to throw a dinner, especially somebody who has some money, who is very uh, affluent, which we, we assume that Matthew is, being a tax collector, for them to throw a party and it would be taking place outside, not inside in a kitchen, but outside in a courtyard. They would sit out and eat. Right? This isn't our culture. There weren't fences, picket fences up all around it. People were able to walk by and see into the courtyards, to see in people's backyards and see what was happening. Okay? Now, I'm going to assume that people haven't changed that much, that people are just as nosy as they are today. Okay? Right? Got any nosy people in here? Come on, tell the truth. If there's something going on, I'm going to look. I may even have an accident trying to look if I'm driving. I want to check it out. What's, what are they doing over there? What's happening? Right? So people would hear the noise. They would hear the sound. They maybe would hear the laughter. They would smell the food, and they would wander over to see what is going on. Right? What's happening here? It was not uncommon for someone to come and stand and listen. Okay? So this party is taking place. We assume Matthew's got a pretty nice spread. There's lots of people here, lots of tax collectors, and a lot of sinners. And we know when sinners get together, it gets loud. So they're having a good time. People are going, what's going on here? The Pharisees are always wondering what Jesus is doing. So they all of a sudden come over and start to listen, start to watch, start to pay attention. They look and they say, hold on, wait, wait, wait. Jesus is sitting with all of these sinners and tax collectors. What in the world is going on? So they go over and they ask, one of the disciples, and I love this, because this is something in the story that I didn't, I'd never read until this week. I'd never paid attention until this week. Um, Luke's account says that the Pharisees come over to the disciples and ask, why are you, why are you guys, why are, why are you and Jesus, why are you all eating 
with sinners and tax collectors. Now, why is that important? Why, what's so unique about that? Where was this tax booth at? Down by the lake, right? It says Jesus is walking by the lake when he comes across Matthew at his toll collecting booth. It's highly possible that Matthew is collecting taxes from the fishermen. Who were Jesus' disciples? Many of them fishermen. So it's quite possible that Matthew has been extorting Peter and Andrew and James and John potentially for years. Right? When I read that, it just hit me all at once. And I was thinking, okay, we've got to look at the disciples in this as well. Man, they're put into some uncomfortable positions, aren't they? It's not just Jesus that's choosing to hang with these sinners. But when he invites them to follow him, they're following with everyone. Everyone is now eating with sinners and tax collectors. All of his disciples. So they come over and they say, why, why are you all eating with, with these people? All right, it was commonly believed at this time the Pharisees were, were, were very, very legalistic. We're going to talk about that word in a second. Okay? They, they believed that to eat with someone was to demonstrate fellowship, friendship, acceptance. Okay? So they would have been looking saying Jesus is condoning What's going on with these sinners and tax collectors? He is being friends with them, okay? They would have looked down on that. Then on top of that, they would have looked and said, hold on, you're eating food prepared by these sinners? All right, they were very ritualistic in that things had to be washed a certain way, things had to be prepared a certain way, and here Jesus is eating with these people who are not religious or not adhering to any of those laws, right? So in every way, Jesus is breaking the rules. Jesus is defiling himself by being among these sinners, and so are his disciples. So they go over and they ask, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And Luke adds to repentance. That's an unbelievably powerful verse. Right? Jesus says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I love that because I believe there's a straightforwardness to what Jesus says. It's, there's, a, there's something that's obvious about that, right? Healthy people don't need a doctor. What is Jesus saying? I am the great physician. I've come to heal. I have come to take care of the sick, not the healthy. I love that. There's a straightforward simplicity to that that makes sense, that had to appeal to the Pharisees on a very straightforward level. He says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, besides this straightforwardness, I think there's also a little, uh, maybe sarcasm is the wrong word, and maybe this is my sickness coming out. <laughs> I, I want to make Jesus a little sarcastic because then it justifies me being it. Um, I... I believe Jesus is saying, look, it's not the healthy, right? Why, why is this upset you guys? Why is this upsetting the religious people? Why are you guys so upset? You're healthy, right? Why would I come to hang out with you? I came to be with the people who are sick. That's not you. You guys aren't sick, obviously, right? You guys are healthy. I came to be with sinners, not the righteous. You're the righteous, so why would I be with you? Aren't these the people I should be with? And I love that because it... Again, it, there's, there's this biting kind of sarcasm in that that cuts the Pharisees and is intended to cut the Pharisees, right? Because what is Jesus saying? Anytime Jesus uses the word righteous or righteousness in terms of the Pharisees, he never means it as righteousness as we would understand it. Okay, righteousness means to be able to stand before God in right standing, to be pleasing to, the God, to God, to be acceptable to God. That's what righteousness means. Jesus never uses that when he's talking about the, the religious leaders of the day, when he's talking to the Pharisees, he always means it as self-righteous. Okay, Jesus is saying, I came here to call sinners, not the self-righteous. Right? The Pharisees got this. They are not missing this. When Jesus talks like this, they know he's talking to them and he is not being kind. Okay? Jesus, I've come for the, for the sick. I've come for the hurting. I've come for the broken. I've come for the sinners not those who are self-righteous. And see, I love this because Jesus is not distinguishing between healthy people and well people. He is not distinguishing between sinners and people who are not sinners. What he's saying is we're all sinners. There are those who know it and those who don't. Okay? Listen, do healthy people typically go to the doctor? 
No. Not typically. It's usually something wrong if healthy people are going to a doctor. Do sick people go to a doctor? Yes. Do sick people who don't know that they're sick go to the doctor? No. So what Jesus is saying here is, I've come for those who recognize their sickness. In order to repent, which he says, I've, called them, I've come to call them to repentance. In order to repent, you must recognize your sin. Okay? So Jesus says, look, I've come for those who recognize they're sick. I've come for those who recognize that they are sinners. I haven't come for the people who don't realize it. Okay? I love that. I want to read something real quick that I came across as Jesus is the, as the physician. It says, Jesus is the perfect physician. He is always available. He always makes a perfect diagnosis. He provides a complete cure, and he even pays the bill. I love that. Jesus says, that's who I am. That's what I've come to do, right? To heal the sick. To heal the sinners who recognize their sinfulness. Okay, now, I want to talk about the Pharisees for a second. Okay, because I believe there's a great contrast in these two parts of the story. The first part of the story is about Jesus and this man. Jesus is extending this unbelievable grace to this man who has done absolutely nothing to deserve it. In the second part of this story, Jesus has a confrontation with the Pharisees, those who believed that they were righteous, that believed that they were righteous because of their own works. Okay, so I think in this story we have a great contrast between grace and works. People who, who see themselves as being forgiven because of the grace of Jesus and people who feel like they are forgiven and they are righteous because of the things that they have done. Okay? So for us, I want to I spend the next couple of minutes just trying to answer this question. Who do you identify with in this story? You identify yourself with Levi, with this sinner deserving nothing from God, or do you identify yourself with with the Pharisees, the people who believe they deserve everything from God because of what they were doing. Now, we're in church, so we know what the right answer is. Okay? I'm sure you're sitting there going, that's a, that's a no-brainer. But are we being honest with ourselves? Where is your righteousness found? Is it found in the grace of Jesus Christ, or is it found in what you do? came across this article and, and, and I pray, and I've been praying this for several days, that we would be open to the conviction of the Holy Spirit this morning. That we would be willing to lay ourselves open, to lay ourselves open bare before God and say, God, examine my heart, examine my mind, and show me what is true. Charles Spurgeon once said, we are all born legalists. We're all born legalists. Uh, this legalists were what the Pharisees were. Okay? And basically, legalism is defined this way. Maybe you've heard the word legalistic or legalism or, or one of those words. This is, this is how John Piper defines legalism. He says, legalism is the conviction that law-keeping is the grounds for our acceptance with God. All right, we'll read that again. The conviction that law-keeping is the grounds for our acceptance with God. And then he adds this, it is a failure to be amazed by grace. Okay, so Spurgeon says we're all born legalists. Now, I don't know exactly what he means by that, whether he means it's something innate in us that we were just born with to be legalists, or if he means that from birth, very early on, we, we are conformed into, into this legalistic way of thinking. I definitely know that the second one is true. We learn this pretty early, don't we, that if you follow the rules, you will get acceptance. Right? The way to, way to gain acceptance is to follow the rules. In every situation, okay, at home, you want that cookie, you better follow the rules. When you go to school, you want good grades, you better follow the rules. You better conform to whatever the regulations are. Even in our friendships, we learn really quickly, if you want to have friends, you better conform to whatever their set of, uh, of rules are for friendship, okay? So very early, we are trained to think legalistically that I will get acceptance based on what I do. Okay, does that make sense? All right? So the question becomes is, do we carry that into our faith? And the answer is, absolutely. Absolutely. We don't, it's not a light switch, we just turn it off and on. It is something that we carry into our faith and we must be broken of. Okay? Now, so I want to I talk about this just a little bit. I came across this this uh, article this week called The Making of a Modern Pharisee. 
And it's written by a guy named Marshall Siegel, and it's, it was on DesiringGod.org, I think. It's John Piper's website, Desiring God. Um, and this guy wrote, wrote this article, The Making of a Modern Pharisee, and in it he identifies six signposts along the highway away from grace. Okay? He's not saying that if you identify with one of these signposts that you are absolutely a Pharisee. What he's saying is you are on the highway headed away from grace, not towards grace. Okay? That we are headed towards being a modern-day Pharisee. Now, I just want to say this about Pharisees, uh, and I've said it several times before. We read the Scriptures, and it's, and it's very easy, if you don't look into the history of it, uh, of who the Pharisees were, to really bang on them hard, to really look at them and say, gosh, what a bunch of, of insensitive, uncompassionate, all of these things that we, we can just, we can hammer them pretty hard. But we have to understand is this group started trying to please God, all right? They started off saying the, the word Pharisee actually means to separate. They're saying we want to be the separated ones. We want to be the ones who follow God's law and follow God's rules as closely as we can because we want to honor him and, and we want him to be pleased with us. That's how it started. But very quickly, legalism began to set in, and it wasn't about pleasing God anymore. It wasn't about his love and his grace and his mercy. It was about them and their actions and their rules and their traditions and their convictions. Okay? So over time, they became very displeasing to God because their righteousness was based on their actions and how well they followed the rules, not based on God and his love and his grace and mercy. Okay? Now, what I'm going to contend this morning is that, again, we have been conditioned to think that way, and it's so easy to slip into that way of thinking when it comes to our faith, where pretty soon it's not about grace, it's not about mercy, it's not about forgiveness, it's about how well we are, we are following the rules, okay? And we become, we, we become dependent on that for our righteousness instead of God's grace, okay? So let's go over these really quickly, six signposts that maybe we are heading away from grace, that we are not trusting and depending on grace as much as we are our works. All right, number one, it says, Pharisees know what to say, but do not do what they say. Mm, that's right. That should have been everybody's reaction. Mm. How many people in here are honest enough to say that there is a dissonance between what you know to be true and what you do? Anybody? There should be everybody. Everybody. All of us should say, man, I, even if you're not a Christian, even if you're not a Christian this morning, I, I would bet everything that I have that there is a huge dissonance between your ideal self, whatever you think you should be doing, how you should be living, all of that and what you're actually doing. All of us have it. All of us have it. Okay? This says the Pharisees knew what to say. They didn't do what they said. Now, the problem comes in that when we decide that we're okay with it. Okay, there's always going to be a dissonance. Till the day we die, we are never going to close that gap completely. We are never going to be exactly who we know that God wants us to be. The question is, are you okay with it? Do you try to justify it? Uh, who was I talking to? might have been Mike Haas. Um, a familiar thing, a common thing that people say is, well, we're only human, Right? But well, we're only human. You know, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just a sinner. Well, yeah, that's true. But what we're saying when we say that is we're trying to justify the dissonance. We're trying to justify the separation. It's saying we're okay with it. All right? When we're okay with that, there is a problem. Matthew 23, 1 through 4. says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, which means they, they are the teachers of the law. So, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you to, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. I love that. Be careful to do everything they tell you to do. Do what they say. Why? Because these people knew what the Word said. Their problem was not in knowing what the law said, what the Word said. It said, listen to what they say. Do what they say, but don't do what they do. So they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Are you okay with knowing what's right? Or do you have a desire and a passion to do what is right? See, the Pharisees justified. They saw their faith as being theological, 
How many people would say, man, I find so many times that my faith is more theological and more theoretical than it is practical? I fall into that category a lot. And we find out when stuff happens in our life, how do we respond? We respond in a way that's very counter to what we say we believe, right? That is a sign to us that our faith is theoretical and theological, not necessarily practical. We don't put it into practice. That's a problem. If your relationship with Jesus lies strictly in what you know, that is a problem. That may be an indication that you are trusting in your intelligence, you're trusting in your intellect, you're trusting in your own understanding more than you are trusting in the grace of Jesus Christ. Okay? Number two. Pharisees practice their faith to be seen by others. Mm. Anybody struggle with that? Now, this requires honesty, doesn't it? This requires getting real. How many people, and I'm not talking about enjoy a pat on the back, because everybody does. Everybody likes to hear, good job. Everybody likes to hear, man, you're, you're talented, you're so good at that. Everybody likes to hear that. I'm talking about purposefully needing someone to recognize you for what you do. Do you find yourself doing things in public that you don't do in private? Anybody? I do. He's going to hit me pretty hard here in a couple of these things. Matthew 23, 5 through 7 says, Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. Phylacteries were these boxes that the, that the Jews would tie to their arm or to their forehead, and then it would be scriptures. So what is Jesus saying? Man, you like to make them extra big. You like to make them extra wide. You like to make the tassels on your robe extra long. Why? To be seen by other people. To look holy. If you're more interested in looking holy than being holy, there's a problem. Okay? Verse 6. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to be called rabbi by others. Matthew 6, 1 through 8. It says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. I love that. Be careful. Why do we need to be careful? Because it's a problem. Because there's danger in it. Okay? There's danger in doing your righteousness in front of other people for them to see, for that being your motivation. It says, so when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by them. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be done in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Anybody struggle with that? How many people want to get caught doing something good? You know what I'm saying? You're doing something good, and you kind of linger a little too long. You could have been done i got to be honest, I struggle with that a little bit. I come in in the mornings, I like to set up the tables, and I get a little bit of vacuuming done and that kind of stuff. And I'm not going to lie, I like when I'm vacuuming somebody walks in. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I li People say, man, the pastor's vacuuming. I'm a good Christian. <laughs> I like it a little too much. Man, and there's times where God puts me in check and says, get that vacuuming done. There's nothing on that spot. Get it done, pack it up. <laughs> All right, you're finished. All right? We, I, we do so many of these things, and, and I think if we were, again, open and honest and saying, Lord, show me when I do these things, that we would be reminded far more than we would want to. How about this one? This is a, this is a big one. And when you pray, verse 5, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to, to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. I love that. Is this verse saying, don't pray in public? It's not what it's saying at all. To stop and to pray with someone in public is, is fantastic. When you feel led to pray for someone, if it's in the middle of Walmart or at McDonald's or wherever it is, guess what you should do? Stop and pray for them right then. So this verse is not against public prayer. It's not what it's saying. But when all of a sudden it's to be seen by others. Or somebody says, man, you know, I've been just really struggling. 
Let's pray about it right now. Everybody, we're praying right now. That's a problem. Look, the babbling part, that's where that hits me. Do you pray differently in front of other people? Anybody? Anybody find yourself praying in a way in front of other people that you go, I don't talk like that. I have never used the words thee or thy ever talking to someone. Ever. I've never just been like, how are thee this morning? I've, just, I've never done that. And sometimes I get in, up in front of people because I'm called upon to pray a lot in situations. And Jason, would you pray? And I go, oh, okay, i got to sound like I know what I'm doing. Father, we love thee. We come before thee. And I'm going, I don't talk like that. Why, do I, why am I doing that? I'm trying to impress people. And that's a problem. That's a problem. And there's been times where God has checked me on that. Well, who are you talking to? That's not how you talk to me normally. Okay, when we begin to change the things that we do when we get in front of other people because we want them to think well of us, we want them to think we're Christians, we want them to think we got our stuff together, we want them to think, that becomes a problem. For the Pharisees, it was all about show. Again, they were more interested in looking holy than being holy. Are you more interested in looking holy or being holy? Number three, Pharisees keep people from Jesus and his grace. Mm. We can say, mm, to every one of these, or at least I can. Mm. Matthew 23, 13 through 15 says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. That's strong words, right? Jesus is not happy about this practice. Okay, so what does that look like in our lives? When do we do this? When do we, when do we keep people from Jesus and grace? I think it shows up like this. I, I think particularly with Christians, we're not intentionally saying, oh, we don't want you to get near Jesus. Let's not talk about Jesus. And I, I don't think we do it that way. But I think we do it like this. Like the Pharisees, they were all about the rules and the rituals. And we're going to talk about some of that in just one second. They were so concerned about those things. They were so concerned about the lists that that's what faith was all about. So they would introduce people into that same belief. It wasn't taking people to Jesus. It wasn't talking about grace. It was talking about the list and their sins and the do's and their don'ts. When we begin to do that with people that are hurting and broken, when we take them to the list and not to Jesus, we are, we are denying them Jesus and his grace. Okay, when we begin to look at other people through judgmental eyes and see them as sinners and say, well, this is what you need to do and this is what you need to do, or if only you would start coming to church and you would start bringing a Bible and you would start doing this and start doing this, when we begin to do that, we are sending people down a road of religion, not true faith. We are sending people down a road of legalism, not a, a faith based on grace. And listen, we can do that so unintentionally, don't we? I mean, we can substitute that so quickly. And I think for so many of us, our, our heart's in the right place. We're trying to help the people, but, but we're still leading them in the wrong direction. How many people know that you can be sincere and sincerely wrong? Okay, when people come to you and they're broken and you immediately start talking about what well, you do know, if you would just stop doing this, you'd be all right. If you would just stop doing it, you would start doing this, and we never get to Jesus. We never get to Jesus. I think this is how we keep people away from Jesus and his grace by instead substituting rules and religion. And that takes us to the next one, for number four. Pharisees add their convictions and traditions to the word of God. Okay, convictions and traditions to the word of God. I tend to hammer on the convictions part a lot, okay, because I, and I've said this so many times lately. When people begin with, well, I believe, that scares me to death. Well, I believe. Unless the next word is out of your mouth or I believe Scripture says, I almost want you to shut up. <laughs> like I know that maybe comes across as mean, but man, we lead people down the wrong path so many times by what we think is right. We talked about this Thursday night. Proverbs tells us there's a way that seems right to a man that leads where? To death, that leads to destruction. It sounds good, and I think we may even mean well by it. But unless we're pointing people to Jesus and using the scriptures to back up our opinions, we could be misleading people. We could be keeping them away from Jesus, not taking them to him. Okay, so our own personal convictions about right or wrong have got to be based on what we see in the scriptures, not just what we think, not just what we've experienced. What does the scripture say? Okay, so we cannot substitute our own beliefs and our own feelings for what the Bible tells us. 
All right, and then traditions. Listen, man, we think of ourselves as being a non-traditional kind of church, but we got traditions, okay? Church is a tradition. Meeting here on two, uh, 1030 every single week, 1040, whatever, is a tradition, <laughs> right? That's what, that's what we do here. So when we begin to start looking at other people, we start making judgments about them based on our traditions rather than the Word of God, there's a problem. Right? When we begin to start looking at people saying, well, that denomination, yeah, they don't really love Jesus. Look how they dress. Yeah, those people don't really love Jesus. They don't even have a drummer. They don't even have a, they don't even have a guitar player. They can't love Jesus like that. When we start looking at those, these are traditions for us. Okay, the song, the type of music that we sing, where we meet, how we dress, all of these things are our traditions. And we cannot impose those on other people. Why? Because they are not the Word of God. The Word of God does not say you've got to meet on Sunday morning at 1030 in this building. He didn't say that. He didn't say, hey, you've got to sing this kind of song. He didn't say that. He didn't say you've got to dress a certain way. He didn't say any of that kind of stuff. So when we start making that stuff on par with God's Word, we create problems. Okay? Our convictions and our traditions can keep people away from God. Mark 7, 9 says, this is talking about, this is what Jesus said, and he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Hmm. That's tough, isn't it? We're not as concerned with what the word of God says as we are with the way that we do things. Right? Listen, I'm, I'm guilty of this a lot. I like tradition. I like the way, I want to do the same thing every week. Right? But when you start reading the scriptures and it's saying, hey, man, pray for people. Call the elders of the church, anoint people with oil, and pray that they be, that they be healed. Is that going to take precedent, or are your traditions going to take precedent? Listen, when somebody says, can I share something? Whew, that makes me nervous. Especially with some people. I'm not going to lie. That makes me nervous. I just want to say, well, let's stick to the script. We've got a plan. It goes well, let's stick to it. Right? When I start substituting that for the Word of God and where God wants to lead and where the Holy Spirit wants to lead, we got problems. When we become so satisfied with our traditions and the way that we do things and we're happy with our routine, it leads to problems. That's leading to legalism, not grace. Okay? Number five, Pharisees lack love for people in need. Matthew 23, 23 through 24. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. That one is, that one is huge. I believe if, if Scripture makes anything clear as to what should mark a Christian? It should be love. It should be compassion. It should be kindness. It should be gentleness. It should be all of these things. Don't look at them or point at them if they're here. But how many people know somebody who doesn't display that at all? Man, they got the religion part down. I mean, they can, they can quote you to scriptures. They've been, they have perfect attendance for the last 50 years. I mean, they have got it down pat. And then you look at them and go, gosh, you're mean. I won't say who it was. There was a lady, man, that taught Sunday school when I, when I was a kid. Maybe she wasn't as mean as she looked, but gosh, I mean, been in Sunday school, taught Sunday school for 120 years. I mean, she was old. It just had all that stuff right, prim and proper, dressed all right, and everything in church every single week, and I was just like, but you're so mean. You know what I mean? It's like, there should be a... a love and an affection and a concern and a care that comes from the people of God. We should not run away from situations like that. We should run towards them, okay? Look, when the, when the Pharisees asked Jesus' disciples, why are you eating with these people? That's what we're called to. We're called to be, there's, this place should be packed full of sinners. I mean rank sinners, not like you good people. You know what I'm talking about? But how many of us run from people like that? Oh, that's going to be messy. That's going to be ugly. They make me uncomfortable. You know, we, how many people run from those kinds of situations? We should be drawn to them. We should be running to those kinds of people. We should have compassion on them. Like when you think about someone, is your first thought one of compassion and kindness or is it of judgment and condemnation? I mean, seriously, and I'm talking about people that are hard and difficult maybe to find those things in. 
Like when you hear about a situation of someone who's done something that you just want to shake your head and go, what the heck is wrong with you? Is, is that our common reaction or is our reaction to say, man, this person is obviously broken? There's something broken in this person. This person needs Jesus. Which one of those is your common response? I mean, Luke 10, 31 and 32 tells us about the, the, the story of the Good Samaritan. And the first two people that pass by this man in need, they justified it, right? Well, I can't make myself unclean. I don't want to get involved in that. What if, you know, what if I get jumped? I'm going to avoid that and I'm going to keep on moving. We can justify that, right? We can look at people and say they're, they're difficult, they're hard to get along with, they're abrasive, they're rude, they're all of these things. We can come up with all those excuses, but we are to be drawn to those kinds of people, not repelled by them, right? We should be going towards people in need, responding in love, not being judgmental and condemning to them. Last one, Pharisees cover sin instead of confessing and repenting. Hmm. Matthew 23, 25 through 28. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to be to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Wow. Do you look to cover your sin, or do you look to repent of your sin? Again, are you concerned with the appearance, or are you concerned with the heart? Look, church is a song that I heard years and years ago. I think it's a Stained Glass Masquerade by, by Casting Crowns. Great song. I would encourage listening to that. Have you ever felt like everybody at church has it together but me? You ever felt like that? I can remember when I first became a pastor, man. I, I would be with other pastors, and I would look and go, gosh, I'm a screw-up. These guys have got it together. And then I got to know them, and I went, nope. <laughs> You're screwed up too. Right? But we want to play the game. We want to play the game. We want to come in as though we got our life together. Everything is good. I can handle everything. Man, when are we going to get honest? I'm telling you, that's one of the things I'm loving about Thursday night with the men. People are being honest. And I think it's only going to get more honest. Are you more concerned with how people look at you? That, oh man, I can't, I can't fall apart. I can't cry. I can't demonstrate that I'm struggling with my faith. I can't do those things because people, people won't think I'm a Christian. Are we more concerned with that or are we concerned with being real and honest and authentic? Are we, cons are we more concerned with finding someone that we can say, dude, I'm struggling? 1 John 1, 6-9 says, If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, and I love that, walk in the light. Don't we want to walk in the light? How many people want to keep hiding stuff in the shadows? But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Listen, it, it, that keeps us from true fellowship, doesn't it? As long as we play the game that everything's good, I got it all together, I don't have any issues, I don't have any problems, it puts a barrier in between us as, as friends, as Christians, as brothers and sisters in Christ. We can't have the true intimate fellowship that God wants us to have when we put up that masquerade. It says, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's a great promise, isn't it? And it starts with what? Verse 9 starts with what word? If, if we want to be forgiven, we want to be purified of all righteousness, then we better be honest. We better be honest about our sin. Does that mean that we just blurt it out in front of everybody? No. No. Jesse and I have had conversations about this. There, there are people that are safe and there are people that aren't safe. Unfortunately, some of you guys aren't safe. You, you, you're going to blab everything that's told to you. And, and man, that shame on us when we do that. Shame on us when we do that because we destroy trust. We destroy what this verse is talking about. I mean, all it takes is for you to blab what someone has confided in you one time, and guess what? They won't share anymore. You've destroyed fellowship for that person. All right? We need to be people who are open and honest and respect one another's privacy, 
hurts, pains, all of, we need to look to protect people, not, not exploit it for our own purposes. You know, I mean, I know that's the way our society works. You hear something juicy, you just got to tell somebody, right? We got to put it out there for people. That's not what we're called to do. The Bible talks about us covering one another, protecting one another, okay? We got to have that mindset. We got to prove trustworthy so that we can be open and honest and transparent. Listen, if you don't have at least somebody that you can talk to and be honest with and say, I am really, really struggling, that's going to eat you up. That's going to eat you up. You're not going to receive forgiveness for that. Why? Because it's going to fester and get bigger and bigger and bigger and impact all kinds of areas in your life. Are you willing to confess your sins to one another? Are you willing to be open and honest with somebody? Find somebody to do that with. Okay, because if not, you're going to put up the front, you're going to pretend everything's okay, and it's going to be about appearances, and it's never going to get into the heart. God is not going to be able to transform your heart, which is what he wants to do. Right? He's not as concerned about you following the rules as he is as your heart being changed to love him and love other people. Okay? Tim Keller said something that I felt like really tied all of this together. You know, this uh, grace versus works driven faith. You know, which, which one are you living out? Are you living this grace? Man, Jesus reached out and touched you when you did not deserve it. Not because you cleaned up your act. How many people had somebody tell you that? You invite them to church, and what do they say? Well, I get myself straight, and then I'll get there. No, no, that's the complete opposite of grace, right? If we do something to earn it, it no longer is grace, okay? Is that, do you realize that my faith, my righteousness, my ability to stand before God comes strictly from the grace of Jesus Christ? That's it. Or are you setting, basing your, your faith on your works, on what you do? Do you look and say, God, you should, you should be blessing me right now because I've earned it? Are you going to stand before God and say, here's my list of things that I did. I've earned it. I deserve to be here with you. Which one is it? I want to warn you. I want to warn me. It is so easy to slip into that legalism. It is. It is so easy. And that's why going back to the cross constantly reminds us of, no, this is grace. This is grace. This is grace. Tim Keller said this, you obey the lawgiver because you have to. I love that. You obey the lawgiver because you have to, but you obey the grace giver because you want to. I love that. Why do you do the things that you do? Because you have to or because you want to? Why are you here today? Because you have to or because you want to? Why are you kind to people? Why are you nice to people? Why do you pray for people? Because you have to or because you want to? Grace compels us to want to. Legalism makes it an obligation, pushes us to have to. Grace or works? What are you basing your faith on? Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to see the areas of our lives where we have been legalistic, where we are too like the Pharisees. Father, reveal that to us. Help us to be open and willing to, to see those things. And then, Lord, help us to give them to you. Take us to the cross. Help, help remind us, Lord, of your grace, that we, we have done nothing to deserve your favor. We've done nothing to deserve your kindness. We've done nothing to deserve your forgiveness. Lord, it's not because we've cleaned ourselves up. It's not because we're following the rules well. It's just simply because you looked at us and said, Mine. You looked at us and said, I want you. You looked at us and said, follow me. Lord, help us to be appreciative of that, to be thankful for that, to live out of that, not conform to the way this world does things, which is to say you need to earn it, you need to deserve it, you need to prove your worth, all of those things. Father, our works are important. They are, they're, they're important. But they should be in response to grace, not trying to earn grace. We look at Matthew as an example. Lord, he, he was extended grace when he didn't deserve it. And what did he do? He responded by throwing this party for you, inviting his friends certainly to tell him of the goodness that he had received, the kindness he had received. May our, our works be a reflection of the grace that we received, not, again, not an attempt to earn it. So finally, help us to trust you, depend on you completely, not our own doing. Our righteousness is found in you, not in us. So we love you, Lord, and we thank you for this message today. May it be eye-opening for us. May it be transform transformational in our lives that we can serve you 
um, because we want to, because we love you, not out of obligation. So we pray these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.